So you might have noticed the trend of funny, quirky TikTok comedians trying to do open mics these days. The old story used to be something like this. Your friends told you you are funny. Your coworkers told you, hey, you should try out comedy, dude. And then you decide to humiliate yourself by finding a restaurant with an open mic. You do it for a year, grind out open mics after open mics. And one night, there's an agent who watches you do comedy. And he's like, you're pretty good, dude. I'm gonna get you into better festival. I'm gonna make you a star. And you're like, fuck yeah, dude. And then you sign with him and he gets you into bigger shows, comedy festivals in Montreal. That leads you to you getting a special and somehow you get five minutes in a movie with Will Ferrell in it. That used to be the story. Well, it's different now. You f my mom for a living? Damn, well. What's your last name? Oh, you think you're funny, huh? Oh, you think you're real funny, huh? Game time, ladies. You clench like you've never clenched before. I live in New York. I go to a lot of comedy shows. I have noticed more and more instead of like old school grungy, like a divorced dad, Louis C.K. looking comedian. Now it's the time for the young, popular, pretty TikTok comedian. So are the older veteran comedians feeling like they're skipping the line because they've won the popularity contest? But does being popular mean that you're funny automatically? I don't know, but I want to find out. So I asked an actual comedian who also happens to be an observer of this niche insider baseball aspect of the comedy space. I have a podcast called Hot Breath, and I've interviewed over 400 comedians on there, and the top three tips have been write jokes, get on stage, and marry someone with a job. Like, people did comedy for, like, the fun of it. They did it for the rush. They did it just to be chasing the next great joke and just getting on stage as much as possible. But people are now starting stand-up comedy as, like, a business decision. How, how, does that, how, how does that make you feel? Um, luckily, when I was looking into this project, it also happened to be the New York City Comedy Festival. So I crashed a bunch of comedy shows here in the city, just hounding producers and comedians to talk to me on camera. So Joel and I are going to watch all of those clips together, and hopefully you get some understanding of what I'm talking about. What was the business of comedy pre-internet, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok? The business of comedy pre-internet and TikTok was gatekeepers controlling your destiny at every level, whether it was trying to get into a comedy club, whether it was trying to get on TV, get into a certain festival, you grind at open mics, develop as a comedian, and network your way into a certain maybe opportunity if you check a certain box. It, it was very out of your control in a lot of ways. I just interviewed a comedian named Ian Bag, and he's been in comedy over 30 years. During the pandemic, he hit rock bottom. Hey, want to hear something dark? Yeah, I'll tell you dark. I was going to insure the shit on myself and kill myself to leave much money for my wife. Really? Yeah. He'd been doing comedy 30 years. He hits rock bottom, fires his manager, his agent, fires his whole team that comedians are supposed to have in the industry sense, hires like a 20 something year old editor, starts posting clips, goes viral, selling out venues all across the country. That was the crazy example I've heard of like a veteran trying to follow the old way of comedy just getting completely fed up and burnt out with it. And he's like, I'll just throw this Hail Mary and it's paid off. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was like, <laughs> like, there is crazy. Dude. Yeah, I was like, I can't segue out of that. Uh, but <laughs> trying to segue out of that would be to show you this clip from the producer I talked to who was working a lot during the New York City Comedy Festival. Look, there's so many comedy clubs where you have to hang out in order to get on stage. Well, that's Adam Gold. He's a comedy producer here in the city. I'm just gonna be running back and forth between here and the green room. Please, welcome to the stage. Yeah, sounds good. He puts up shows of all sizes in New York City and works a lot with TikTokers and Instagram comedians who are on the rise and helps them find their open mic footing. You know, that is your sort of like initiation and being around, right? And then eventually at midnight, maybe you'll be thrown on stage. And when the opportunity arises, obviously, you know, you got to perform. It's a lot of grinding and invisible work that a lot of people aren't willing to do once they get into it. And maybe they see the internet as a way to try to skip that line, but you can't, you can't skip the stage. Like the only way to develop stage presence and that confidence that comedy requires 
is to get on stage and it's a lot of times at these grungy open mics at a, on a Tuesday at 11 in front of a drunk crowd that didn't even know there was going to be comedy. Can you capture their attention? This is my most prized possession. You ready for this? Yeah. You, you know the AVN Awards, the uh, porn awards? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So I won uh, the awards for, I wrote the Hamilton parody that got made. Oh. Hamilton. That's Aton. He's a comedian who started his own show in his apartment. I am the creator of Apartment Fest. This is a four day comedy festival they were throwing in my apartment. Six shows total. It's beautiful. He played the old game of comedy, grinded open mics, got a show on Amazon, and now is playing the new game of comedy. Harry Potter, Jewish or anti Semitic. Fiends, Jewish or anti Semitic. Baseball, Jewish or anti Semitic. Chester Cheeto. Jewish oh. or anti-Semitic. Biggest thing I'm seeing, or one of the things that I'm seeing when I go out of town and when I do tour dates, is that you'll see some TikTokers who became very big that all of a sudden have to do like a lot of material. And oftentimes it's like a little bit not great. Uh, Eitan said right there is that when he's on the road, sometimes he comes across a bunch of TikTok comedians who are there because, you know, uh, the manager or whoever is handling that open mic knows that this guy or gal, he has followers, which means that if he performs, there will be butts on seats and they will buy drinks, they will buy food, and they are not funny sometimes. What do you think about that cohort of people entering the space? Yeah, it, it, it kind of reminds me of that that phrase, get bitter or get better. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you can look at it from the perspective of, oh, they built this following and can sell tickets, so now they're skipping the line. Okay. Well, that's not really in your control. You can't control that they're blowing up and selling tickets. What can you control? These TikTok comedians are selling tickets. They're making money. They're keeping the venues in business. So you just kind of kind of get with it or get left behind, really. We'll say that there are comics that have found TikTok fame that have been able to sustain that fame and go and do stand up and they are very good at stand up. Like I just opened up for Pinky Patel in Albany. She just started doing stand up about a year and a half ago, two years ago, because she was very big on TikTok and she's very, very good at it. So some people do have that ability. You know, as a person, as a performer, you know, I needed to have the, the personal, I needed to be good enough at stand up um, to, main, to ensure that when I became bigger on social, I would be able to take those opportunities that the social following would give me and to, you know, perform well and stuff. So I think it was always very important to make sure that I was like continuing to improve as a stand up. If someone sells out a, a show based on, yeah, their, their clout, but if the, if the live show doesn't back it up, they're probably going to get a selfie and then be like, all right, but I'm never coming back. I'll just follow him online or maybe I'll unfollow this comedian or this TikToker because they weren't funny on stage. From my experience on working with live events, they always want to see like a proof of concept that the person yes. who is hosting can sell out seats, can put yes. butts on seats. And you are working with a lot of TikTokers and YouTubers yes. and Instagram folks who have a lot of cloud, but they might not have done live events. Right. So when it comes to convincing all these venues and stuff like that, what is your pitch? Comedy is subjective. Yeah. The one thing that is not subjective is ticket sales, okay. right? Yeah. And ticket history. <laughs> yeah. And there's a whole business around touring, yeah. right? Comedy touring, music touring, that yeah. if you prove that you are selling tickets, yeah. Other venues are gonna say, yeah, okay, yeah. like maybe maybe I'm not a big fan of that specific brand of comedy, comedy, but if it sells tickets and these tickets are being purchased by people that are 21 and up, yeah. right, and not children, yeah. right, and they, they hopefully drinks, drink, yeah, yeah and, they, and they buy drinks, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all these venues make money yeah. from drink sales and yeah. ticket revenue. The splits are always like questionable, right? Yeah. Whether it's a 50-50 split or some sort of sort of standard 70-30 yeah. split, um, but at the end of the day, you know, yes, comedy is subjective. But if you sell tickets, it's an easy sell. Yeah. What I realized, like following Adam, was that it's not just about the comedian; it's a whole ecosystem, and there are multiple players here. So that includes producers, that means the manager of the bar, that means the guy who's serving that night. So you putting butts on seats has a cascading effect and the domino falls on a bunch of different people. And yes, you might not be as funny as the guy who only did open mic and has full control of the IRL craft, but the fact that you can bring people outside and activate your audience is its own value prop for sure and that that reminds me of interviewing several club owners and them saying 
we're a restaurant that has a stage in it. Mm. You know, like we're here, we're here to make money. You know, we're not necessarily here to find the next Richard Pryor or whatever. Mm. Like we're running a business. One thing which I realized that, you know, like the guy who's managing the venue and who used to be the gatekeeper, he might not be as romantic about the craft of comedy as, you know, like nerds like I am. The vast majority aren't romantic about like the comedian side of it. Like they really are. They're running a business and it just happens to be like a comedy club, but it really is. They're selling food and drinks. Was there a learning curve where you realized that, hey, this isn't about me? Like the fact that I'm not getting screen time, uh, uh, stage time in the beginning, it's not, that is not a referendum on whether or not I'm funny. It can be a little bit, but there are other factors yeah. in play. How did you realize that in your career? I mean, it literally took me like eight or nine years to really come to that realization and adopt that mindset of, well, okay, I'm not relying on anyone else. It's up to me. There no more scarcity mentality. You know, people aren't taking anything from me. I just need to be creating more for myself. And that was a game changer in my career for sure. How do most stand up comedians who are coming into the space make their first dollar? Um, make their first dollar. Uh, usually dog walking. Uh, <laughs> so the way to do it is as a stand up is that you start doing stand up, you do a million open mics, eventually you get a five minute video. And from that five minute video, you're able to do, uh, submit to festivals. And eventually, you know, maybe it's not your first five minute, maybe it's your next five minutes or whatever, but eventually you start getting into festivals. And we start getting into festivals, you meet other people from around the country. So the way that standups, you know, start to make their first dollar is by getting booked on smaller shows, you know, in whatever city they're in. And then, you know, as they continue to get bigger, they're able to tour and they're able to make more money elsewhere. You learn that weirdly in New York, it's like a one percenter thing where like one percent of comedians here are able to sustain themselves from gigs in New York and stuff like that. The rest of them. You tell me what can the rest of them do? 99%? Yeah. The old way of doing comedy was move to New York or LA, climb through the ranks, find opportunities. People can blow up from Kansas now. Like, you know, with, with the internet, it really has become the ultimate equalizer. Nate Bargatze is selling out arenas and he lives in Nashville. Oh, uh, let's stay on that beat. And the next guy I'm going to show you is uh, Carlos. And um, he's from Miami. He's part of the huge Hispanic community in stand-up comedy in Miami. He was here in New York for comedy week. And I got him to talk to me outside the stand. And that's exactly what he told me. I had New York friends that like were moving to Miami, ironically yeah. from New York. Yeah. A bunch of people, like friends that I like have known from before that had moved here and then they moved back to Miami. Comedians moving to Miami, Miami from yeah, New York yeah. and we were like, oh dude, we're killing it. Like Andrew Schultz was there for like yeah, the yeah, residency. Yeah, like, show from there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, I was like, oh dude, we're popping off like crazy. In the States in general, there were a lot of different versions of what find what people find funny. Talk to me about like all these like subcultures within the same country. A lady I just worked with like two weeks ago, we did a fundraiser together. She blew up on social media as the recovering Californian. Never in a million years would like 10 years ago, Comedy Central be like, oh, we need a TV show about a lady who's the recovering Californian. Like it is so specific. They're like, like who is, how are we gonna get advertisers? What audience is this gonna be for? But she has hundreds of thousands of followers talking about this one specific subculture that most people may not even know exists. Let's get into like the business and the comedy a little bit more. Once they quiet down outside. Ah, are they spraying your window? What is happening? They are, it's construction. It's like New York is always doing scaffolding construction. <laughs> you know what, you made the right choice. I'm gonna move to Atlanta as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's important to do the open mic thing if you're gonna do the TikTok. Like if you were a TikToker, and it is two different things, like doing sketches online or doing like, just like bits online or things like that is very different. You're not experiencing it with a live audience. So like, you might not even have like stage presses to do it or like you might, there's just ways that like you might forget things on stage. So it's like a lot of things that like come with time, like those four or five years of just grinding through open mics, going out every single night doing it, yeah. that when you're doing it through TikTok, you kind of need that. But it's helpful that you come in with like a following and yeah. then you're still able to do these things. 
um, for much bigger crowds, but I think you still got to put in the work. People that don't put in the work and are just TikTok famous and their agent or their manager's like, oh, you just go tour? Yeah. They'll feel, and I've seen it because I like feature open for them in Miami or different parts of the country. Like they'll feel, you just know that it's not a stand up. Like, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not someone that's coming from the stand up world. It's just yeah. someone that like was told to kind of like, this is what you have to do to make more money. So, so let's get into like, Joel's advice column real quick. If you had to kind of like talk to a TikTok comedian, they kind of sort of have established that they're funny online and they for the first time are now getting in front of actual human beings on a stage, IRL, in a ticketed event. What are they getting themselves into and how different of a world is it? Whew. I mean, I would, I would recommend they do open mics in front of strangers to prepare for this gig where they are like selling tickets and performing in front of fans. They may love you online, but if they come to your show and it's not great, they're going to remember that feeling. I would honestly recommend, and I have like social media comedian friends who started out this way. They would host the show and have like a showcase of their favorite comedians perform on the show. So it's less pressure on the TikToker to have to do all this headlining time, but instead they can just kind of come up, be the personality just have fun with the audience and interactive and things, and then get to showcase more experienced comedians that the audience will also love and actually introduce their fan base to maybe unknown comedians. I think that's a great way to kind of ease into the live event space. Just because if, if you headline and you've never really performed and you're supposed to do 45 minutes to an hour, like it's, it's, I mean, people spend 10 years learning how to, perform for an hour on stage pause get like explain this to me what goes into and this is a really nebulous question so i apologize for it what goes into developing 10 minutes of material hours of trial and error to go into that distillation of like a great 10 minutes and this is 10 minutes not 10 minutes when everything works and the audience is laughing and everything is breathing and there's a nice rhythm. This is 10 minutes of like proven tested material. People think they have 10 minutes. And then when one joke bombs, that whole set will shrink to three minutes real quick. Because you don't know how to work a crowd. You don't know how to create a connection, develop it with them and really have a actual conversation. Comedy is actually a dialogue. You say something, their laughter is the reply. If you watched the early stand-up pandemic um, videos and stuff like that, or if you ever watch a Tonight Show special, uh, a Tonight Show five minutes or like a late night five minutes, you'll notice that the sound is terrible. It always sounds like the comic is monologuing to himself with smatterings of audience. So Schultz was the first one to start miking the crowd more, and that was massive. You have to mic the crowd. Comedy is tennis. It's, it's, it's comedy is pong, it's an energy exchange. I mean, you might not be talking back to me, but like I'm saying something to you and you need to give me energy back. Yeah. Because if you don't, the person watching at home is cringing, even if it's hilarious. You know, when he was talking about that, when I filmed my stuff outside, what I made sure to do was that, you know, I talked with the camera person who was filming stuff outside, made sure to capture audio, to leave a bunch of mics across the audience so that the even if the laughs like evaporated out, you'd still be getting them at the ground floor. Yeah, laughter is, it's tribal. Like the, it really is like a communal experience. That's why at comedy clubs, the seats are very close together. Everyone is like really on top of each other. When Schultz started miking the audience, that really translated that communal experience online. So people watching alone, probably on their toilet, yeah. really <laughs> felt like they're not alone in watching this. So they're more likely to laugh. They're more likely to share it because they do feel that community aspect. They're probably more likely to then go see that comic live because they want to be a part of that audience. Yeah, dude. I mean, Schultz is the reason we're here. I mean, honestly, I think he, I think Andrew's changed. I think he changed the game for everybody. Like the reason that people are like able to go viral now, people are able to like, get famous out of just comedy or a clip. Yeah. It's through Andrew Schultz's method, which is like posting a clip a week, and then now to some people posting a clip a day, and then like, you know, hoping that one of them picks up and then that one just fuels the rest of your algorithm. And you know, I, I mean, I, I certainly do Thinking it. back in the day used to be, why the fuck are you giving away your material for free online? And uh, now it is, you give away your material, people find you funny, and then 
they come to see you live. The clips element, as far as content and stuff, has completely changed, you know, everything. Obviously, we're seeing like a lot more crowd work, stuff like that, but I do think it's more of a blip. I think that people, you're seeing people have a certain amount of prepared material and then they burn through that material if they're posting every other day or something like that, and then it turns into crowd work material. So we saw the comedy community in as a whole, you know, run out of material so then they start doing crowd work material to, to you know to fill that void and you know that's kind of the place that we're in whatever comedy trend happens it's almost like stand up always kind of maintains as like a baseline so you're going to see trends within stand up but i you know i don't think at the end of the day that like stand up as a whole is going to change like it's it's so base you know it's just like a person with a microphone you just you can't beat the stage i mean at the end of the day a single person standing on a stage with a microphone entertaining for an hour, it, nothing replicates that. Like honestly, like a comedy show is literally, it's, it's one of the most pure and intimate live experiences you can have because even at concerts now, everyone's filming and things like that. A comedy show is really one of the last places you can go to. A lot of comedy shows now, like you're not even allowed to have your phone. They'll put it in like these, these like pouches that lock to where you can't even get access to them. So a comedy show is like, it's a, it's almost like the last place that you really can just kind of unplug and really just have an intimate experience with a, a group of people. Today for like comedians, do they, should they like still wait around for a uh, George Shapiro to pick them up? Like what should their next step Who's be? Who's George Shapiro? Um, Epstein's cousin? <laughs> no, no, no. Who, uh, his manager, Seinfeld's manager. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so, I had no idea. I thought he was my orthodontist. <laughs> George Shapiro? <laughs> he fixed my dad's ACL. Uh, I have I have managers and stuff like that, and oftentimes I do get asked about like managers, and people ask me for recs on managers, and my opinion on those has always been, as, a, as an anxious Jew, <laughs> it's always been, you gotta make sure that you have your own work. I come to them, most of the time with stuff that I am working on and I'm like, how are you gonna you know, monetize this, leverage this, push this out or whatever. You can't wait for other people to do this for you, especially because like you're in a time where TikTok social media has given people with a hustle, like a hustle mentality or you know, with a built-in hustle on them to actually like, you know, make traction on that hustle. It used to be way harder when there was only so many avenues to become big, but now like Everyone with the TikTok app can become big, and the people that have like the better hustle and are hotter <laughs> usually become famous. I was watching the Seinfeld documentary on Netflix. It's about like how he found George Shapiro, his manager, and he then opened up the access to the whole world for him, and the rest is history, basically. As important of a blip in the time that was, now it is not that game. Aton said it's like people who have that built-in hustle that's what the medium caters to, right? If you have the chutzpah of and the tenacity of being your own distributor as well as being the talent, that's game set match. It's hard work. It is very difficult to create one viral piece of content. It's very difficult to create it consistently. It's very difficult to then build an audience and nurture that audience. And really, like it's, although it's different from stand up. It's not, that doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. It, it is a job and I really respect the people who are able to do it at a high level. And I hope to do that one day as well. It's the medium and it's like, they're taking advantage of it. Just like you took advantage of the fact that you can't, I'm not saying you, like people took advantage back in the day of the fact that they can just go to a restaurant and perform. Like, think about that. That in itself is an insane proposition for its own time. Someone's gonna like talk in my ear while I'm trying to have a conversation across the guy in the table. That's such a weird thing. Like what? Like when did that happen? Why can't I just like eat in peace? So, but no, no, no. Here is this form of entertainment we came up with for you and there are people who are gonna make their make this their career. That's crazy. And that happened and people took advantage of it. And now something else is happening. That's cool too. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And it is interesting to see interviewing so many OG comedians when I first started the podcast eight years ago and asking them about social media. Yeah. And back then the consensus was these kids are cheating. They're not really learning stand up. They're X, Y, and Z. There was an excuse for why what they're doing was wrong. Now the consensus is more like these OG comedians are like, oh, I need to figure this out. This is the new way 
to be a stand-up comedian. This is the reality of where we are. You can complain about it and sell less tickets, or you can figure out what they're doing, apply it to what you're trying to do, yeah. and start selling more tickets. That's really where the consensus is now. For a long time, it was very negative, and there are still some haters out there, I would say, but there's way more appreciation.